Hi everyone and welcome to session two, uh, which is going to be presented for us by Dr. Ben Galdekra, a doctor, best-selling author, academic and campaigner. I'm sure many of you heard about him and followed him on Twitter, so I'm not going to spend too much time introducing uh, our presenter. Um, so uh, Ben, over to you now. Uh, trying to you see that was two operators on the same mute button hello right uh hey look, thanks for having me um once again it's uh in a very strange circumstances because i can't see you or hear you so i might as well be shouting into the void but um that feels very much like my whole career hey who's that is that Mohammed, Mohammed. Yeah. Hi, hi, Ben. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Fire. Hey, great. Um, all right. So look, um, I am here to talk about a couple of things. Um, number one, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about a paper that we did recently in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine on how to make NHS coalface data analytics great again. Uh, we can all have a good sense of humour about Donald Trump now it's over. Um, and that's a, a paper that we pulled together with a huge, a galaxy of stars, junior and senior, old and young, um, looking at um, what can be done to modernize coalface analytics in the NHS and really capitalize on the best practice and the energy that's around and out there. And then secondly, I'd like to talk about Open Safely. And Open Safely is really um, a, a platform that puts all of the principles and ambition around modern, open, collaborative, computational data science into practice. It takes all of the things that we set out in that uh, policy paper and and reifies them, puts them in concrete terms. And um, I'm here to recruit. Uh, actually, firstly, we, we are literally recruiting new staff and we would love to have somebody with experience as a CCG, uh, the ICS um, or trust uh, analyst work on our team um, but also we're looking for people who'd like to be external users of open safely to do any kind of covid related research and i'll talk a little bit about how that will work and will hume from my team on thursday at 10 35 a.m is going to be doing a really concrete run through uh, at this same conference on exactly how you implement an analysis in open safely <coughs> just slightly raining on my computer right okay so um first up uh practical analytics in the nhs it's very very common these days to see people coming out with these kind of tiggerish enthusiastic phrases like data is the raw material of the 21st century and better use of data is obviously a central feature of the nhs long-term plan but as everybody on this call knows, um, data alone doesn't produce insights. If you want to capitalise on the opportunities in data to improve health and care, you need data and outstanding data analysis. But in my view, and the view of many that we have collected together over the last couple of years, policymakers in academia have focused almost exclusively on pure academic research, stuff around the etiology of disease, for example. But the field of practical coalface analytics has been very, very sadly and dangerously, to my mind, neglected. And by practical coalface analytics, I mean the kind of stuff that people like you do. And in fact, the people like we, like uh, my team do in Oxford. So variation in care analyses that identify opportunities to improve quality and safety and cost effectiveness of care. Modelling around waiting lists or optimum locations for new services. Evaluations of whether new interventions or reorganisations have achieved their clinical logistic or logistic objectives that run <clears throat> very quickly and pragmatically rather than over the course of three years. Uh, monitoring volume of activity and cost to make sure that we're getting value from clinical contracts. All of that sort of stuff, that's vital to ensuring that data is used to deliver direct improvements in patient care, to identify problems early and to deliver efficiency gains. They require very similar skills, methods and tools to traditional epidemiology research. But the practical analytics workforce in the NHS who does this kind of work is given very little formal training and has been in many cases sidelined. Now that <coughs> is compounded by the fact that analyses outside of the fabulous NHSR community 
are all too often done typically behind closed doors, which blocks error checking and reuse. And clinicians and commissioners, lastly, often lack the skills and support needed to ask good questions of data. And that blocks better use of data. So in our JRSM paper, which I will post as a link in the chat later, um, we set out to, number one, identify the barriers to the better use of analytics. And we split these into three categories, technical, cultural and regulatory. Number two, to identify potential solutions to those. And then thirdly, because we're super concrete, frame those barriers and solutions as action statements. So specific person slash organization should do specific things so that specific outcome uh, can be achieved. And in our paper, we talk about themes and solutions that arise from these discussions that encompassed um, people from organizations as diverse as CCGs, trusts, Health Foundation, King's Fund, academia, yes, but principally not. Um, and overall, we set out the need for a 21st century NHS analyst workforce supported by clear trajectories and training opportunities, a culture of build it once and share it to everyone, built around modern, open computational data science techniques, capacity building, not just for analyst staff, but also for non-analyst staff to help senior leaders and other uh, folk out in the system participate in informed conversations about data, to be better customers of data. And lastly, <clears throat> frameworks to ensure that we get good value from externally commissioned uh, analytics. So I'm going to run through this very quickly. I want to get to open safely, but I think it's really important as, as context. And um, the last thing I would say is normally when I talk, I can see people's faces in front of me or something that's not permitted on Crowdcast. If what I'm saying is too much, if you disagree massively, if I've lost the room, just sort of hurl abuse at me in the chat bar. I'll keep that open. And if you massively approve, then you know, feel free to whip me up by going, yay, GitHub or something. Uh, right, okay, let me close some windows, hang on. Right. Okay, so uh, first up, how many data analysts are there in the NHS? The answer is nobody knows, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, the Health Foundation report from a couple of years ago, led by Martin Bardsley, estimates around 10,000. Most of those are in very junior roles, focused on data management, which is a vitally important task. Um, and those jobs are advertised and classified under Agenda for Change as admin slash clerical rather than scientific slash clinical. And although this might sound like a small thing, I think that actually demonstrates a real problem in the mindset around how analysts lists are um, created, managed, fostered and encouraged. Um, so analysts get very little guidance on the skills that, that they need in order to progress. There's very little strategic thought about providing inspiring leaders to look up to. And so consequently, where these um, kinds of uh, that kind of cognitive infrastructure is created, it tends to be through grassroots organisations like NHSR community or like AFA or what are essentially kind of public good civic tech startups rather than through national infrastructure. Um, for the NHS and its patients to benefit from high quality practical operational research, we need a, a 21st century NHS analyst workforce. And that means a range of skills and skill levels, innovative and efficient data anal analysis. And, and to do that, we need the boring stuff, clear career trajectories and effective development and training opportunities. So that's the first thing that we focus on in our paper. Um, if great analysts are gonna be retained in the NHS in an environment where most of you could go off and be paid substantially more elsewhere, they need to be inspired and they need to see opportunities for career progression. Now, at the moment, in order to uh, progress in, in NHS analyst roles, typically NHS job descriptions require analysts to become generalist managers in order to rise in seniority. Now that's not the case in other parts of government and there's a lot of really outstanding practice to learn from. Um, for example, uh, the government economic service, the government statistical service, the government operational research service and the government social research service. Each of those professions inside government, they act as a kind of parallel system of line management and CPD. So alongside your role in any particular government department or niche, you're part of a profession that also has a head of profession. 
It has clear career paths and progression opportunities that are supported by genuine, uh, accessible, continuing professional development. And they hold their staff to high standards because they set out clear um, best practice guidance and they offer accreditation. They require analysts to adhere to a clear code of conduct. Now to rebuild that in the NHS would require a lot of foundational work formally reclassifying analyst roles under NHS Agenda for Change as scientific slash clinical, not admin slash clerical, is an important start, but also it needs things like a national competency framework, an accompanying pay scale that sets out job descriptions and skills that take people from junior analyst grades all the way up to a new head of profession role. You've got to make it clear what analysts need to do, need to achieve, need to learn and need to deliver in order to progress up that. Um, and you also need that to help their perhaps less technical senior managers identify and appoint and train appropriately skilled data analysts. There's actually something quite peculiar about senior roles in analytics in the NHS. And I'm really struck by this. So I'm a, a doctor. Um, and I also do bits of research and bits of policy work, and I can write an adequate line of Python or R. Um, but here's the funny thing. Um, when the government wants to access senior doctors, it goes for a doctor. When the government wants to access senior lawyers, it gets a lawyer. When it wants a senior economist, it finds an economist. All too often, when government wants to access uh, senior leaders in data science, it will find a generalist manager who has for some but not all of their career managed other people who do data science. Now that's unusual, that is a peculiarity, that's an anomaly and I think there's something quite interesting around how government accesses new forms of expertise in particular. Things like economics or medicine have been around forever, they are certificated, there's a piece of paper you can look for. I think most of us would recognise that some of the best data scientists, especially the really practical people who are really good at uh, the kind of data management kung fu, rather than just taking a perfectly formatted CSV that's been created by somebody else and running a single beautiful model across it. The people who are practically valuable very frequently have actually got no practical qualifications at all. In fact, if we were going to use the terminology of a, of a, of a regression model, um, Having a, having a qualification in data science is actually quite a weak predictor of competence. There are people who can brandish pieces of paper who are really not very good. And there are people who are extraordinarily good, who have only a humanities degree and four years or 10 years or 20 years of very, very deep dive, um, hard won practical experience. Now, I don't think you can ever capture the complexity of the world in um, ordinal categorical variables. And that is fundamentally what um, uh, see what um, sort of certification and um, qualifications and licensing and accreditation come down to. But I think we can do very, very, very substantially better. And also um, tools like uh, accreditation are also part of shaping a culture. Um, if you make a, a clear progression pathway for individuals through a profession, then you create clear templates that people can slot into and you create something that's visible to their boss. So in our paper, we talk about all of the things that you'd expect to manifest those kinds of broader notions. So NHS data analyst and data scientist apprenticeship schemes, undergraduate and postgraduate training and accredited certificate programs and also crucially um, open uh, courses, open learning for um, allied professionals, because I think one of the things that's really striking to me is that if you're somebody in the NHS today who wants to learn about practical data science in healthcare, you have to um, you have to basically go and sit next to Brian over there or Barbara over there. There's no textbook, there's no course. And if you are a clinician, if you are a general manager who wants to become more data savvy, I think the more that we can do to make stuff open, um, the better. Next, um, the, there is a striking shortcoming that cuts across both academia and also practical analytics, and it's a historical anomaly. And it's a very interesting um, local problem. In the NHS, 
And in a lot of health data research, there is a culture of people working behind closed doors, developing local code on a local machine. Now that is the polar opposite of modern open collaborative computational data science, a culture of build it once and share it to everyone. As a consequence of the kind of closed working methods that we see, which are no one's fault, it's just a kind of accident of history and an accident of, um, or, or a lack of ambition and, and direction maybe from, uh, or compulsion from uh, funders and managers. As a consequence of those closed working methods, people outside the direct analytic team doing a given piece of work are completely blocked from being able to critically review the methods, to spot problems and fix them to learn from the work and replicate it. Nobody can use or reuse other people's code on their own local data. And what's more, it deprives the system of a commons of knowledge that could help to train and inspire new staff. Now, when I say that, it might sound a bit flappy. Let me tell you about, um, there's a chap called Brian McKenna and a lady called Anna Rowan. If I say chap and lady, that's both sort of equally uh, perverse descriptors. Um, and they came to us from the office of the chief pharmacist at NHS England. When they came to us, neither of us really knew, ne neither of them really knew about um, how to do uh, data analytics in any, certainly not in any kind of script based way. When they landed within six weeks of landing, they were producing Jupyter notebooks, live interactive notebooks with text to explain the problem they set out to solve code describing how they'd solved it and the outputs of that code all embedded in one single system. Now, how were they able to do that? Well, it was two steps. Number one, they went to do just a general data science course. But number two, they came to us and saw existing Jupyter notebooks, code from our team that was annotated, that was delivering exactly the analytics that they were looking to produce themselves. And so there was a worked example of exactly what they would hope to do, staring them in the face from the moment they arrived. Now, it's important to have ambition around textbooks and courses and formalised approaches towards building a new workforce. But actually, if you want to help people learn on the job, the best thing you can do is make it easy for them to see other people at work. So modern open analytic methods is one thing that helps to build that kind of collaborative culture. So in our paper, we talk about the need to pull away from a culture of manual labor in Excel, embrace the benefits. And I know this is Coles to Newcastle at the NHSR conference of modern open analytic methods. And that means reusable scripts, open source tools like Python, R and Jupyter notebooks. Um, and also supporting the use of, of um, industry standard knowledge exchange platforms like GitHub, like Stack Exchange, making sure that staff have got the time needed to share, recognizing that that kind of sharing is an important part of community building and technical capacity building across the whole system. Also providing best practice guidance on how to share appropriately. And to my mind, frankly, taking a hard line, insisting that all analytic code is shared where it's funded by the state. And it needs to be good enough, not perfect. I think a lot of people get very constipated about sharing their code. Um, we've written a lot in the past about how adequate code is adequate. It doesn't need to be a perfectly curated library, lovely if it is, but good enough code and good enough documentation is fine. Now, that doesn't happen out of nowhere and it doesn't happen from just saying that it ought to happen. Um, it needs a collective and modestly resourced effort to create a public library of tagged, edited, curated workbooks, how-to guides with the patient data obviously stripped out that can be readily reused. It needs data controllers, regulators and policy makers to support it by making it, as I said, in my view, mandatory with narrow exceptions where necessary for NHS analysts, code, uh, analysts to share code in that manner. I think it also needs uh, professional bodies like AFA to be supported to promote conversation and community around this way of working. Um, now, I'm very keen to get onto Open Safely because that's a way of kind of building out this sort of uh, this way of, of delivering um, services. But let me just say we are collecting uh, a raggle taggle band of people who want to um, 
see forward plot movement on these issues. Now, let me just give you very quickly the email address in the chat of Jess Morley. And if you would like to be part of this movement, if I say Viking Squad, it sounds too fighty, doesn't it? If you want to crack it, get that one. Ben, Jess is in chat. Thank you, Ben. You've got 10 more minutes, by the way. So, but thank right. you. Okay. And okay. I would, I, 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 there are a few questions, so hopefully we can ask you some of those towards the end. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Look, let me tell you about Open Safely. And I very, very, very strongly encourage you to go to Will Hume's talk at 10 uh, 35 on Thursday, where you can learn about how it works. So, Open Safely. Um, Working on behalf of NHS England, we've now built a full open source, highly secure analytics platform running across the full raw pseudonymized primary care records of 24 million people, rising soon to 55 million people. That's 95% of the population of England. We've got every patient's full primary care GP record with all diagnoses, tests, referrals, prescriptions, and so on, all linked to their data from SUS, so as you all know, that's hospital admissions, outpatients visits. We've got ECDS, coded a and &E attendances. We've got CPNS, death in hospital from COVID. We've got SGSS, which is COVID test results. We've got ONS, cause of death in and out of hospital. We've got household data. So we've built a household identifier in collaboration with the EHR vendors. And that tells us for each individual person about the full history and demographics of all of their pseudonymized uh, co-occupants in each household. We know for each household whether it's a care home, we know its approximate location. <clears throat> we've got the ICNOC data, the ITU data, we've got the ISERIC data, which is detailed hospital records of hospitalised COVID patients. And despite this unprecedented scale of data, privacy advocates like MedConfidential have actively praised our privacy model. Now why is that? Well it's happened because we've pursued a completely new model. For privacy, security, low cost and near real time data access, we've built the analytics platform inside the EHR data center of the major EHR providers. So we've taken the analytics platform to the place where the data already resides. <clears throat> but we've also gone beyond that. We've gone beyond building a, a typical off the shelf trusted research environment. Open safely can be used to perform any task that requires large scale computation across a large number of patient records. And that includes formal analysis, so elaborate statistical models, but also simple tables and graphs. You can very, very quickly in a very short uh, amount of time generate tables selling you uh, how many patients have got each characteristic in each practice in each month over time and so on. And once set up, because it's all reproducible analytic pipelines and scripts, analyses can be rerun at regular intervals. Let me tell you how it works, because I think it's really important and I think you're the kind of crowd who will get it. First up, analysts write code on GitHub using the Open Safely software in a standard format to describe how they would like the raw patient data converted into their intermediate data set for analysis. Now you do that using codelists.opensafely.org first up, if somebody could type that into the chat, that would be magnificent. Now at codelists.opensafely.org, you will see all of the um, code lists that have ever, nobody else has typed it, I'm gonna take um, If you go to codelists.opensafely.org, you can see the code lists, which are the uh, lists of SNOMED codes and read codes and so on that are used to convert the one row per event data into a one row, one row per patient data set. And it's a one row per patient data set or a run, one row per organization data set that uh, analysts like us would typically use to uh, generate their um, analysis. Now you do that using the Open Safely cohort extractor. And when you write the code in the Open Safely cohort extractor, which I will now post an example of into the chat, um, that does two really important things. And this is super cool in ways that you might not expect. So first up, uh, it's done in Python, ultimately YAML. Um, it's designed to be human readable. So um, here you've said, further up this script, um, you've said, okay, generate a, a data set that's one row per patient from the one row per event data set. Uh, and I want it to be, uh, I want a variable called COPD, and that will be patients who have any of the COPD codes in their history. 
But you also, you can see further down, return expectations, incidents equals 0.15. So you're saying there, and this is just an example, you're saying, I'm expecting the incidents, and you could argue about whether it's incidents or prevalence, but it's the appearance of a code, so we would call it incidents just for theoretical reasons. You say, I'm expecting the incidents to be 15%. So that's used in two important ways. Number one, when you extract your real data, it checks your expectations against the real data. So sanity checking is built into the framework. But secondly and crucially, that expectation is used to create a synthetic dummy data set. Now that dummy data set is completely randomly generated. It doesn't respect the co-segregation of exposure and outcome variables, but it doesn't need to. It's there purely for you to develop your code. So you then use this simulated dummy data <clears throat> and literally anybody who wants to can do this, by the way, if you go to github.com slash open safely, you can clone a repo. You can generate uh, code lists if you, you need to ask for a login from us at the moment to do code lists. You can generate a dummy data set and then you develop your R data or Python code in GitHub using that dummy data set to check that your code is capable of running to completion. Once you're certain that your code is capable of running to completion and is passing all tests, so we make sure that you're not you haven't put a comma in the wrong place, it hasn't called a variable that doesn't exist or used a capital in a place where it shouldn't. Once you're certain that your data is uh, that your code is capable of running to completion, then your cohort extraction code and your data analysis code are parceled up in a container using Docker. They get pushed through into the live environment. They execute against the real code. And then the outputs, which are the only thing you ever get to see or touch, are dumped in a folder which you review, review to make sure it's not disclosive. So you can see the log files, the tables, and the graphs. And when you're confident that there's nothing disclosive in there, you press a big button to push that back out to the GitHub repo from where it came. Now, all of this runs entirely in the open. Every single line of code that anyone issues is in the open by default. Every single action on the data is logged, so everybody anywhere who wishes to can see every single GitHub repo and the commit ID, the status of that repo at the moment in time that it ran against the records. All of this was built in the course of five weeks for our first end-to-end -end analysis, and now we're building it out. And we want external users. We want people like you to come and use it. Right now, it's a slightly challenging process. It requires that you have good solid advanced computational data science skills it means that you need to be good at working on github docker python and so on it also just during the initial phase of onboarding external people as collaborators rather than uh, if you like external customers um, i think it's fair to say that we're looking for people with a good fit because you'll be working closely with our team this is about developing analytic tools and services and frameworks in collaboration We've already got a fantastic group of people working with us. We've just got folk joining us from NHS X slash E. We've got loads of people from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine who've been with us from the start uh, and other researchers hopefully joining us um, as we have more capacity to get people on board. It's a very small team, but the team really is the key to all of this. Um, this was built as a massive pro bono collaboration during COVID. And that collaboration is the key to what we've built. We've all been working on behalf of NHS England with honorary contracts, in fact, to NHS England. We've all been working in a very close Slack channel across three main groups. So it's my group at Oxford, the Data Lab, and we're a mixture of full stack commercial grade software developers, but also traditional academic researchers who now straddle the boundary between software development and um, academic research. We call them developer epidemiologists. And then also clinicians, and policy experts. We've teamed up with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine's Electronic Health Records Research Group, who really are the A-team for working with primary care data. It's very easy with primary care data to do terrible research very quickly. Um, and this group really knows where the bodies are buried, where the bear traps lie. And that's really important because we are embedding a lot of that tacit and explicit knowledge in libraries of code, as you'll be able to see on GitHub. And then lastly, we're working in very close collaboration with the electronic health records vendors, TPP and EMIS. And that really is the key to all of this. Um, it should have happened a million years ago. 
electronic health record suppliers, I think, have often been a little frustrated at some of their interactions with um, uh, people who've wanted to work on the data, but because um, they're people who want to think about um, about developing their software. They want to uh, they want to work with people who know how to work with that kind of raw event level data. What we've built in Open Safely is a framework where people can self-service, people can describe the transformations from that raw event level data without needing to have conversations, without needing the hand-holding. And that we're building towards a commons of knowledge around those transformations. And that's kind of the last reason why we want expert users like you to come in, but also why we need them. close collaborators. Mohammed's about to shout at me to stop. Um, because we need people who are up for not just delivering their own personal uh, analytic outputs, but people who want to um, bed in and think about how to create libraries and generate documentation on the fly for all of the great analysts who come after them. If you want to register interest, you can send an email to any email address you can possibly find for me on the internet. You can send an email to Jess Morley, who I sent earlier. You can send an email to team at opensafely.org. Literally any, any way of contacting me you can think of, I will reply to you. Um, we want NHS analysts who are interested in working in this way, ideally who have existing skills, but if you don't have existing skills around things like GitHub, Docker and Python, um, then you can help us develop our onboarding process uh, for people who lack those skills. Sorry to ramble on and thank you for having me. Ben, uh, thank you so much. It's been fantastic, by the way. Um, so I'm just, there you go. I, I, I don't know if you heard that round of applause, Ben, but that was my attempt to at least mimic the real world. Um, absolutely fantastic, Ben. Thank you. Ben, we would be, uh, look, uh, there are some questions on here. So one of them is, um, you know, can we ask Ben for how we can have some workshops on doing the amazing things that you've described for for NHS analysts to kind of get to know uh, the open source, um, the open safety work that you've described. So um, we would do all the kind of legwork from the central team, but if you, if some of your colleagues would be happy to host a workshop or two, that would be really great. Yeah, definitely. Well, look, the answer is that is already happening. It's timetabled in your event, in your conference. It's happening at 10.35 with Will Hume. Will Hume is doing um, a presentation on Open Safely, and he's one of the um, analysts in my team. He's written all of our external onboarding documentation, and he's going to go through um, in very, very uh, excruciating, um, explicit detail exactly how you extract a cohort and run analytic code on Open Safely. Okay, great. And and uh, you, uh, you've also mentioned a few things, I think, which which means that we uh, from the NHSR team would also develop uh, ensure that we can support our, our community by having courses on things like GitHub and Docker and other things, really. So so I think there's homework for us to think about there as well. Um, Ben, this idea of a of a wiki book for day to day and an analysis in the NHS. Do you have a sense of of how we might? It's it's one of those things which which would be great if it's an orga organically, but there seems to be like a need for some element of um, coordination here. So do you have a sense of how we go from where we are now to 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 doing something which is coordinated? Yeah, look, I strongly agree. I think um, this sort of thing doesn't happen by magic. Um, we've got quite a clear vision of what this should look like and we pushed it around various funders and nobody bought. Uh, we're going to try again during this um, during this phase of work and see if we can get any further. Um, again, uh, we're running a workshop on this soon with Jess Morley. So if you email Jess Morley, um, in fact, I think Mama Hamid, I think you're already involved yes, in that yeah, one. Yeah. Um, but my, my sense of it is um, it requires... Um, We'll be posting something on this soon, but it requires, first of all, um, a, a large community. The organic party is a large community of people sharing workbooks, sharing things on existing places, you know, Jupyter Notebooks and GitHub and so on. Um, secondly, it requires that those are shared under open licenses, which allows multiple people to republish and to index and to reuse and create their own journeys through that. I think there's a real problem, especially with some of the larger organizations around the health data space, um, for people to want to exhibit some sort of ownership of things. And I can understand the impulse because people want to uh, curate and maintain some kind of um, control. But I think allowing things to be reused is an absolute no-brainer. 
I think then it requires a permissive data schema around tagging so that things are easily discoverable. But lastly, and most importantly, it requires at least, I would say, two people whose job it is to do knowledge management. Yeah, um, that's great. Proper information scientists, proper librarians, not librarians in the sense of um, people wearing tweed, putting books away on shelves, but people who know about take complex um, technical knowledge about a diverse field, how to make things discoverable, how to help people find what they're looking for, how to ensure that prior paths through the forest um, are made easier for others to follow and so on. Um, and that's a job of work. It's not a hobby um, and it's not something that will happen by accident. It's um, It needs to be more than anything, I think, the foreground job of, as I said, two people and um, not something they do a day a week and not something we, they do. We're certainly keen to, 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 to support that conversation. Ben, one last question and then we'll, we'll have to move on. Just a very quick question. Somebody's asked, uh, do you, do you, would you recommend uh, our NHS analysts doing uh, an MSc in data science? Uh, honestly, right now, I, I don't know. So there's a real problem with health data research in the UK in general, obviously, you know, there's no true sharing. There's a lot of very closed methods. Um, I, I would love to see a health data science masters that met the needs of practical coalface analysts. Yes. Um, I guess I need to see it. At the moment, what I see is um, is sort of epidemiology courses being repurposed. Yeah. I think you could stitch something together out of fifty percent existing courses and 50% new stuff. Um, but at the same time, uh, I do worry that master's courses are part of a, potentially part of a kind of old antiquated rent seeking revenue model for building capacity. And that slightly gives me the heebie-jeebies. I would say the way to build capacity in the system right now is um, to get people sharing the work they do on the job in things like Jupyter Notebooks so that other people can learn on the job um, with protected time, with short courses that are centrally resourced, but then made uh, through open competition and then made openly accessible to all after they've been created. I think that's probably the most efficient way of building capacity. Ben, thank you. Always a pleasure to hear you. Thank you so much for giving time. And uh, and we look forward to kind of closer collaboration between the projects you're involved in and the NHSL community. Thank you very much indeed. Hey, look, I need you all to send me emails. We want people like you to come and work on our stuff. So come, please come. I'm not joking. We want you. Come. Fantastic. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you. Anastasia, can we move on to our next speaker, please? Yes. So thank you again, Ben. Uh, we hope we will close, uh, work, work closely again. Uh, and then uh, all uh, participants, you can either go to drop down menu and choose Adam's session, or you all will be automatically pulled into this when it starts. So thanks again, uh, and we will see you in a bit then. Bye.